Hello! Today we will be looking at aerodynamics and the role it plays in transportation technologies. Here's a question. What do you think is the fastest accelerating vehicle in the world? Remember that acceleration isn't a measurement of a vehicle's top speed, but how quickly a vehicle can gain speed. In a race, the person with the faster acceleration gets up to speed before the competitor. So what do you think? A pro stock car? A rocket? Maybe a giant slingshot ride at the fair? Actually, the award for quickest accelerating vehicle goes to the top fuel dragster. These amazing machines can make it from a dead stop to over 300 miles per hour in just a few seconds. That's some incredible acceleration. In the process, they guzzle gallons of specialized racing fuel. The rear tires actually deform under the stress, and engines have been known to get so hot that they can actually weld themselves together. Some incredible engineering goes into these high-end racing machines. As we will see, there is a lot more to the study of aerodynamics than just speed. Aerodynamics is defined as the study of forces and the resulting motion of objects through the air. In other words, it looks at ways to make vehicles slice through the air more efficiently, with the least possible amount of resistance. So why study aerodynamics? Well, speed is one reason. Ever since we invented vehicles, people have been in love with racing them. Building vehicles that can go faster has been a pursuit of technology for a very long time. Another reason is comfort, since Riding in an aerodynamic vehicle offers a smoother and more comfortable ride than one that gets blown around in the wind. Let's not forget style. As designers explore aerodynamic body designs, we've unlocked sleek, curvy, beautiful vehicles that show anyone who couldn't already tell, look at me, I've got style. But probably the biggest, most important reason for studying aerodynamics is fuel efficiency. Aerodynamic vehicles are more efficient. They can go further with less fuel than their less advanced counterparts. And in a world of rising fuel prices and a shrinking global supply, every drop counts. Since efficient vehicles means more money in your pocket and less impact on the earth, aerodynamics has become a top concern for automotive engineers everywhere. Here's an example of this principle in action. You may have been riding down the highway and noticed tractor trailers with these side skirts attached to them, or fairings like these on the back doors. These are actually an advancement in aerodynamic design, allowing the truck to slice through the air more easily than it could before. This diagram shows the decrease in air turbulence with the addition of the fairings. The top image shows a truck with no fairings, and the red and yellow discoloration behind the truck shows turbulent air, which acts against the truck's forward motion. The middle image shows a significant reduction in turbulence by adding fairings. The lower image shows larger fairings installed, which produced an even greater reduction in air turbulence. This has some pretty excellent impacts. The cost of installing one of these kits is about $2,000, and a trucker will save enough fuel to cover the cost of the kit in just about one year. That's about 400 gallons of diesel fuel and $2,000 saved every year, which has about the same environmental impact as taking one car off the road. Multiply that by how many trucks are on the road, and you have a pretty tasty piece of technology. Big trucks aren't the only ones taking advantage of good aerodynamic design. Consumer cars have seen some major advancements over the last century. In 1908, Ford launched the Model T, which was the first mass-produced automobile that was widely available and affordable to the average American. As you can see, aerodynamics was not a primary concern in early car design. The boxy shape and flat surfaces and open top uh, kind of give it away. But hey, fuel was cheap and these things didn't go all that fast anyway. Fast forward to 1921 and another notable vehicle hits the scene. The Rumpler Trumpfenwagen was a curious piece of ingenuity designed by an Austrian engineer with an eye for aerodynamics. The car was remarkably aerodynamic for its time and would even rival today's cars in that regard. However, this vehicle didn't really catch on. It had some mechanical issues, but mostly it just looked a little too strange. The car's designer actually borrowed the design from nature's most aerodynamic shape, the raindrop. In fact, the name Tropfenwagen means teardrop car. This makes sense when you think about it. 
You take a fluid substance that can take any shape it wants to and drop it through the air. Naturally, it will take the most efficient possible shape to slice through the air on its way to the ground. Savvy designers noticed this and incorporated the raindrop shape into vehicle design to try to optimize performance. In 1934, American manufacturers got on board with aerodynamic design. One of the early models to hit the pavement was the Chrysler Airflow. This car introduced the concept that aerodynamic design could be stylish and beautiful. This too, however, never sold very well. Another honorable mention on the journey through aerodynamic design is the Audi 100. This vehicle came out in 1982, and it employed some breakthrough aerodynamic designs that helped it to set a new record for drag resistance. While this car didn't last too long, it did have an important impact. Its release started an informal competition between automakers to produce ever more aerodynamic vehicles with the hopes of becoming the most efficient on the block. This competition continues today as countless models of cars come and go, each contributing a little bit to the study of aerodynamics. As a result, today's vehicles offer an unprecedented level of aerodynamic efficiency. The term drag refers to air resistance that works against a vehicle as it moves forward. The effect of drag can actually be measured using a drag coefficient. The drag coefficient is calculated based on a lot of factors, such as the vehicle's velocity, density, surface area, and the drag acting on the vehicle. Other factors, such as the vehicle's weight, will also affect acceleration. By understanding the drag coefficient, it is possible to compare two vehicles side by side and see which vehicle is more aerodynamic. Engineers work hard to reduce the drag coefficient in any way that they can because reducing this number by even 0.01 can mean a fuel savings of one mile per gallon. Designing aerodynamic shapes is one thing, but how can we test out a design to be sure that it works? One way is by using a wind tunnel. The vehicle is placed inside an enclosed tunnel and giant fans blow air past the vehicle to simulate driving. A stream of smoke is added so that engineers can observe the way the air flows over the vehicle. Any turbulence in the smoke indicates an inefficiency so that the engineers can try to correct it. And cars aren't the only thing that use wind tunnels to test aerodynamics. Speed athletes, such as cyclists or skiers, might also use a wind tunnel to study their own aerodynamics. Ski and bike races are sometimes won by a couple thousandths of a second, so any way that an athlete can improve their performance counts. They might be able to reduce drag a tiny bit by just shifting their shoulders slightly, dropping their head down, uh, or other small tactics like that. With computer-aided design on a fast rise, aerodynamics can also be tested using computer simulations. This simulation compares a BMW 3 Series from 1987 with the same car produced in 2007. The discolored areas show the spots of greatest air resistance. Notice the significant decrease in the 2007 car. By making subtle changes to the shape of the windshield, grill, rear view mirrors, and hood, BMW engineers were able to drop the drag coefficient of the 3 Series from 0.43 to 0.34. That's an improvement of 9 miles per gallon in fuel efficiency just by slightly changing the shape of a few parts. Pretty cool. This computer-generated image shows an SUV, which are well known to have a poorer fuel economy than smaller cars. This simulation clearly shows areas of major wind resistance on the grill, windshield, rear view mirrors, and even the tires. The broad, flat surfaces of this vehicle act like a battering ram through the air as it drives, which isn't great strategy if you're trying to stretch your gas tank further. Here's an interesting thought. The BMW we just looked at had a drag coefficient of 0.43 back in 1987. And by 2007, it was improved to 0.34. What do you think the drag coefficient would be of a Formula One race car like this one? If you guessed super low, I'm sorry to tell you that you're mistaken. Cars like these actually have a drag coefficient closer to 0.75. Wait a second. How can a car this fast have such a high drag coefficient? Wouldn't that slow them down? Well, yes and no. See, some cars can actually get moving so fast 
that they become unstable and difficult to steer. High pressure air can build up beneath the car and create enough lift force to send them flying. So designers incorporated features such as scoops on the front of race cars and spoilers on the rear, whose job it is to deliberately create drag in order to boost the car's downforce and hold it down to the racetrack. This computer simulation shows the areas where downforce is created to stabilize the car. Pretty neat, huh? So the next time your friend tries to tell you how much faster their car is since adding an aftermarket spoiler, you set them straight and remind them that spoilers don't help you go faster and only improve handling if you go fast enough to generate downforce. So thanks for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two about aerodynamics. Next, we are going to be moving into the workshop and actually building our very own CO2-powered dragsters. If you'd like to see how that goes, check out my CO2 dragster instructional video, and I will see it in the lab real soon.